So we've been doing a series uh, for several weeks now, and this is the sixth one, the final one. It's, we've called it Foundations. Most of you, if not all of you, were here for uh, those that preceded. Maybe this is your first time here or you're watching online for the first time, so I'll just remind you or bring it to your attention. This all came out of a, a, a survey that came out of the Arizona uh, Christian University, or their American Worldview Inventory over the ages 20 to 39. And about 60% of them claim to be Christian, but out of the 60% that claim to be Christian, it's pretty disturbing that only 2% of those, or even less than 2% of those, held to the things that we would say were foundational truths in our faith. Things like Jesus lived a sinless life. God is all-powerful and all-knowing. Salvation is a gift from God. The deceiver is real. A Christian must share their faith, and the Bible is reliable. We've gone over each one of these each week, and this morning we're going to hit the last one. They were in no particular order, but this morning I had the privilege of trying to bring this and unpack for you that our God, our God is all-powerful, and He is all-knowing. And my words are not going to be sufficient to try to give the tr expound this truth but I pray that his spirit would open your spirit and he would speak to you and you would see him for his greatness and his mercy. When we say this, there are, there are immutable characteristics about God's nature and this is just two of those that we're looking at and the word immutable is not something I use in my daily vocabulary. So I'll point that out to you that it means it's simply unchanging over time or it's un able to be changed. He is all-powerful. He is all-knowing, and it'll never change. There's a scripture that passes, puts this together. Uh, Psalm 147 says, great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. What do we mean when we say God is all-powerful? What are we really saying? There's a word that tries to capture this, and, and I'm no scholar, but this word is omnipotent. Now, in the King James Bible, I found it's actually in the word, but the English Standard Version that I'm usually using uses the word the Almighty. But simply what this word omnipotent means is there is nothing, there is absolutely nothing that God cannot do. He has all power. So what does that mean for the Christian? If, if you're a Christian, if you know him, then it should give you great comfort, that should give you great peace, because he not only has all power, he not only is all-knowing, but he is all good. So this awesome God that has all power in the universe, he would never use this power that he has for evil, and that should give us comfort. Here's a scripture that I have learned and stood on. Romans 8, 28 says that, for we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. This is the first scripture that anybody ever shared with me as a new Christian. 1991, my sister shared this with me over the phone, and I was in a state in my life that things were devastating and torn apart and falling apart, and she shared Romans 8:28 with me, and, and I found absolutely no comfort in it. Because when you're in the middle of a difficult situation, and your life is falling apart, and somebody says, well, God's going to use this for good. You don't get it. But the point I've learned in the last three decades of walking with Christ is that it's for those who love God, and I'm living this life according to His purpose. So what do we mean when we say God is all-knowing? There's a word for this one. It's omniscient. It simply means that God has perfect knowledge of all things. There's nothing he doesn't know. God's never going to, you're never going to go to God with a problem. You're never going to have a problem so big that when you go to God and you talk to him about it, he's going to say, uh, well, hold up. Let me, let me go check on this. Let me go figure this out and I'll get back with you because he already knows. There's nothing going to shock him because there's nothing he doesn't already know. He just wants me to admit it. He just wants me to bring it to him. We put it all over our money in God we trust, but I have to ask the question this morning, do we have it written on our heart? We've got it written on our money, but is it written in our spirit? Do we trust Him? It's easy to trust Him when everything's going good. It's tough to trust Him. It shows where you're at in your relationship when everything's going bad and when everything's difficult and things are being stretched if you trust Him. 
We believe God is all-powerful and we believe He's all-knowing because the Bible describes Him this way. And I don't have time to go through the Scriptures. You'll have to do this on your own. I challenge you to go look it up. I'm just going to summarize a few of these just to give you a taste. We know that God's all-powerful because He holds all things together according to the book of Hebrews and Colossians. God can make people do what He pleases according to Romans chapter 9. He's done it in the past. And according to Revelation chapter 17, He's going to do it in the future. God's power is evident in creation, and God refers to himself in Genesis 17, 1. He refers to himself as the Almighty God. There's nothing too difficult for him, according to Jeremiah, and his purposes cannot be stopped, according to Daniel. He does not get tired, and he does not get weary, according to Isaiah, and all things are possible for him, according to the book of Matthew. He has the power to save and keep a believer, according to 1 Peter. And according to the book of Corinthians, the first one, he raises believers from the dead. He is Almighty God. There is nothing he cannot do. But he does choose to limit himself in several areas by his own choice. Nobody limits him but himself. Our mighty God cannot lie, according to Titus, and he cannot be tempted by evil, according to James, and he is always faithful, and he cannot deny himself. And according to Psalm 119, his word cannot fail. He has absolutely all knowledge. He is the God of knowledge. He has infinite knowledge. He has known all things from eternity, past and future, and his knowledge is without limit, and no one can teach him anything. And that's not an arrogant statement, but he's unteachable. The fact is, he already knows. He knows what's happening on the earth right now. He predicts events ahead of time, according to Isaiah. He already knows what's going to happen, and he tells his prophets so that people can record it and know that he's God. He sees all things, and his knowledge is denied by the wicked because the wicked believe God God cannot see their sin. But 1 Chronicles tells us that the Lord searches every single heart. God has all knowledge. He knows me better than I know myself. And he knows me so well that even as a believer, when I don't know that I'm who I think I am, he, he knows more than I know. He, he knows me better than I know my own heart. By this, we know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. This passage in Ephesians chapter 3 captures it pretty well, but I find it very challenging You're probably familiar with it, but let me remind you now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think. According to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I find this verse very challenging. If if you captured that verse, what he's saying is God's power is so great. You'll never go to God and pray about something that's so big in your life that God goes, well, that's just too big because you can't even think of the things that he's capable of. His power is so vast and so magnificent. It's beyond my ability to comprehend and think of the things he's able to do. But what's really challenging to me about that verse is he says that power works in us. What does that look like? How do we do that? Now, I want to be clear, God hasn't surrendered his power to us, but this God that we're talking about this morning, he's entered into relationship with us. And the fact that he's entered into relationship with us is that he includes us in the work that he's doing on the earth right now. Because it's his purpose, remember? So how do I do this? The way that I do this is I have to choose to live an intentional life and I have to live it on purpose. I have to live it for his purpose. And the best way I've learned to do that is I have to be a man of prayer. I have to spend time in prayer, I have to spend time with God, and I have to listen. And I have to be a person who's a worshiper, and not just on Sunday morning. I have to live my life listening to music that builds me up and allows me to enter into worship to this great God who deserves to hear my worship. And absolutely, I have to be a person of obedience to his word that he's revealed 
and it absolutely requires of me sometimes that I live a life of sacrifice. There's some places I can't go, some things I can't do, and there's some things that I won't participate in because I'm trying my best to be a man of obedience and serve my God and live for His purpose because I want that power working through me so that it touch the life of someone else because this gift that we've got is best given away. Why would anybody who claims to be a Christian not believe maybe that God is all powerful and that God knows everything? Well, maybe some of the obvious questions that would come to mind that we might attempt to look at this morning is if God's all powerful, then why does he allow bad things to happen? I, and I'll admit, I, I came to Christ, if you don't know my story briefly, I'll just tell you, I was a 31-year-old adult, uh, and I'm ashamed to say that I waited that long to come to know Christ Jesus as my Lord. But it was the difficulty in life, the bad things that happened. I was an arrogant, proud, young guy who was determined to do things my way, make my own decisions, and, account, and, and answer to no one, so he allowed me to run out of self. He allowed me to hit the end of myself where everything I had built up was falling apart, and I have wrestled with the fact that he lets bad things happen sometimes since the moment of my conversion. When I was over in Garden City, Georgia, over here at Kessler Point Apartments in 1991, I knelt by the side of my bed, and I said, God, I believe you're my, you are God, and your son Jesus died for my sin." And I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. And if you can use a man like me, I'll serve you the rest of my life. I said, I don't know who he is, but I think I'm going to need that Holy Spirit that I've heard people talk about because I can't live this life by myself. And I can't live it in the flesh. He's got to be living it through me. And I made a mess of my life up to that point. So I needed it fixed. And I cried out to him and I said, if I've waited too long in my arrogance and my pride for you to fix this mess that I've made, I'm still going to serve you. But if you can save it, if you can fix it, I'm asking you to do it. Now, a few years later, I went through the transition of life and somebody said to me, you know, you just didn't have enough faith to believe God to save that situation. And I think they missed the point. Because the point was, my real problem was I was a sinner. My real problem was it more than I needed God to fix anything in my life, I needed a savior. And the outcome of the prayer that I prayed, asking him to fix my situation that I had created, whether it came to pass or not, didn't determine the amount of power that God has. He is great and he has all power. He not only has all powerful, he is the all powerful and he knows all. And he's always good. Because every good thing in your life came from God. Whether you recognize it or not, every good thing that happened to me prior to 1991, whether I gave him glory for it or not, it came down from him. James puts it this way. He said, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. So you might ask this question, some people have, if God's so powerful, if he's all powerful, then why doesn't he create a universe where evil doesn't exist? Is he able to do that? Certainly he could if he wanted to create another universe that evil doesn't exist, but why would we expect the fact if he did that we would be there? Now, I don't mean by that, okay, if God created this other universe where no evil existed, you'd be too evil to be there. That's not what I'm saying, but the point is, this is when God chose to create Jim McLean. He knit me together in the womb of a woman named Joanne McLean in Saraland, Alabama, married to a man named John McLean. And if you change any part of that combination, I cease to exist. If God created a, you know, the universe where evil didn't exist, I wouldn't be there because he wouldn't have created me. Now, there would probably be somebody else there, but it wouldn't be me. And the point is, at least I see in my word, is that my Bible tells me that God desired a relationship with you, and I'm so humbled he desired a relationship with me. So he chose to make me, and he chose to make you, and you're no accident, no matter what the, the lead up to your uh, birth is in this world, he created you to have relationship with you. And for a relationship to be meaningful, it has to be freely chosen. For a relationship to be freely chosen, 
there has to be the possibility of rejection. And it's that possibility of rejection that sets us up for sin to exist and pain to be experienced. And it's part of the experience of being human on this earth. Job cried out. If you're familiar with the book of Job, he cried out, why was I ever born? Now, he was in some difficulty far past surpassing anything I've ever experienced. So I've never quite been there, but as he cried out, why was I ever born? Him and his religious friends went around and around for about 37 chapters asking questions. Why was he born? What sin had he committed? Why did this happen to him? Is it something he knew, something he wasn't aware of? But in chapter 38, after uh, Job pleads with God to show up and explain it to him, I can relate to where he was at. When you go through difficulties, I think you can relate. Job was crying out and he was saying, God, I want you to show up because I want you to make this go away. Or in the middle of my problem, show me what I did that caused it so that I can repent of it and it can go away. But in chapter 38, God shows up and God starts asking some questions. He starts asking some God-sized questions, not some human-sized questions, because remember, his ability is far beyond my ability to even think. God starts asking Job some questions and ask him to answer him. Tell me about creating the universe, Job. Tell me about forming the world. Tell me about setting the boundaries of the oceans and tell me how you control the weather because our God is so much greater than we are. When we experience suffering, I just want to know what it is and what caused it so it'll stop. And I know you can relate to it. But what we sometimes have to do is just recognize our limits of our understanding. If God explained it to me, what makes me think I would be able to comprehend the explanation? There are times I just have to trust God in the middle of, this tra- in the, middle of the fire, in the middle of the problem, in the middle of the test, because he's God. I can see the hand of God all around me. I've experienced difficulty and pain, and I know sometimes Brendan and I sometimes talk about it. We've, we've gone through some things in our life I'm old enough now that I've walked down this road for a bit. I, I remember going to a funeral, one of, the, one of several painful experiences, probably the one of, I will share is, I was a young Marine with a family of my own, and I remember going to Saraland or Satsuma, Alabama while I was on leave for a funeral. And that funeral was for a nephew that wasn't even old enough to go to school yet. And if you've ever been to a funeral for a child, somebody that young, it, it is heartbreaking. And I remember standing at that funeral at that gravesite, listening to a young pastor share the gospel, and I remember being angry. I was angry because I wasn't serving God, and I was angry because he took that opportunity to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, because I was, again, angry. I was filled with arrogance and pride, and I was not yet ready to humble myself, but I have learned over the years, I see the hand of God all around me. I love backpacking and I love getting into the mountains and you get into the Appalachian Mountains and I feel so small and God's so big. And I can see him all through it as I look over the vast expanse of those mountains as they stretch around me. Maybe you're somebody who loves the ocean. You go to the ocean and whether it's uh, still and calm or it's rough and, and, and churning, you see the power of God in the vast expanse of the ocean all around you. And then in storms, I see the power of God in the storm. And his power is beyond the storm, as powerful as that is. Ravi Zacharias, a really wise man who went to be with the Lord this year, he put it this way. He said, God put enough into the world to make faith in him a reasonable thing, but he left enough out to make it impossible to live by reason alone. It's not just an intellectual ascent. It's not just knowing whether there must be a God. It has to go past that to the point of relationship where I accept him as my Savior and I know him. I don't know everything, and I'm not going to know everything in this life. And even reading the scriptures, I'm not going to know everything because Deuteronomy 29 put it this way, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. But the things that are revealed belong to us and to our children forever that we may do all the words of this law. There's some things God kept to himself. There's some secret things he chose not to reveal and will not reveal. And there are some other things that he has revealed to us, and those are the things that I'm accountable for, to know them and to live them and leave the rest up to my great God. 
I want to understand it. We want to understand it. We want all the answers, but we don't always get all the answers. And we're not the only ones that have struggled through life with these questions of where is God and the difficulty. I'll use Gideon as an example. Gideon spoke out and he said, Please, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his wonderful deeds that our fathers recounted to us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and given us into the hand of Midian. What Gideon is saying is, I've grown up hearing about God all my life. My parents have told me about him. The other people in the community have told me about him. I've heard about our history. But where's he at? And why is he letting all this happen? What Gideon was really saying... Is, is, is God really who they told me he is? He's not the only one to struggle with this. I'll give you another example. Habakkuk, he cried out and he said, Oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help and you will not hear? Or cry to you violence and you'll not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise so the law is paralyzed. And justice never goes forth, for the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. What, what Habakkuk was saying is he was saying, I don't like what I'm seeing. I'm seeing people taken advantage of. I'm seeing people that are being abused. I see injustice in this world, and I see people with power mistreating those that don't have it. God, why do you allow it, and what are you going to do about it, and why haven't you done something already? And in the next chapter, God speaks up, and what Habakkuk hears is not good news because in his life and in the situation he found himself, it was about to get a whole lot worse. But at the end of chapter 2, he says something very powerful. He says, the righteous shall live by his faith. That's where it doesn't matter what you go through or what you're seeing, you still know God is all-powerful, and you've entered into a relationship with him, and you're walking by faith, not by sight. And the way to do that is what he said just before this. I have to know what God has said. I have to be a person who's in his word. I have to get the word of God in me. I have to be a part of the story. I do that by writing it down. I do that by memorizing it. And then I do that by standing on it. And I stand on it until it comes to pass. And if I don't see it in this life, it'll happen after I've left but I'm trusting God to the end that he's going to be true to his word. This is one of the other favorite scriptures of mine, Isaiah 40, verse 31. It's a little different. It's not a background slide because this is a photograph of a card. My sister sent this to me in 1992. I was a new Christian. I was struggling to walk this life of faith that I'm trying to communicate to you. And I was having trouble and difficulty and everything was still falling apart. And I'd been in this about a year and it just was, it wasn't happening like I thought it was going to. I didn't understand what it was going to mean to walk this out and live this day by day. And she sent this to me in the mail. And I've still got it. It's still on top of my toolbox. Back then, I was an aircraft mechanic by trade. It sat on my toolbox. I had my own toolbox at work, a piece of plexiglass across the top. And I slid that card underneath it. So every time I went back to get a 916, so I'd go back to get a 3 8 drive ratchet and uh, head back out to do some work, I could look over there and very quickly I could remind myself, Hey, those that wait upon the Lord, they're going to renew their strength and they're going to mount up with wings as eagles. I didn't know what that was going to look like, but I knew I was going to do it if I just keep on standing. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And it was in a time when I really felt like fainting and I really felt like being weary and I really felt like this just wasn't working in my life. So I still got that card and it's still on top of my toolbox. It was the second scripture somebody shared with me in this walk of faith that I've entered into. What it comes down to really is just God is sovereign. He, he contains and controls all power. It is all within his control, but our God has given free, free will to mankind. Now, the church has argued over this for a number of years, how far his sovereignty stretches and whether man has free will or not have free will or how much free will he has. But God is all powerful. But how do you look at this? Do you see our God in this matter, that God is all-powerful and he causes everything that happens? Or maybe you have a viewpoint where you look at it and you say, God sometimes, even though he's all-powerful, he limits his power to allow human mankind the freedom to choose. What's your view of God? How do you see him? 
The way I believe this works and the way I'd like to communicate it to you this morning as I start wrapping this up is that God is sovereign. He is absolutely sovereign, and he has given man free will, and that little gap in between, whatever the size of that is and however you place that, it is the perfect setup for salvation through Jesus the Christ. Ravi Zacharias, again, he put it this way. He said, a man rejects God neither because of intellectual demands nor because of the scarcity of evidence. A man rejects God because of his moral resistance that refuses to admit his need for God. That was me up to 1991. Where are you at? Are you still resisting? Or have you entered into the relationship? So where is this all-powerful God? During my pain, during my disappointment, and during the struggles I find myself in in life, I would offer you this morning, the scripture tells me that he's right there in the middle of it with me. This God we're talking about, 1 Peter captures it this way. He says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. That is the Christmas story. I love this. And I'm so glad to be a part of a church that can have fun and celebrate on a Christmas, a Sunday morning just before Christmas, the gifts. We have a, a big family. We'll be gathering several times over the next week or two and exchanging gifts. I encourage you to as well and enjoy the time that you have with those you love. But the Christmas story is not about a baby in a manger. Christmas story is not even about Jesus on a cross. Christmas story is not even about Jesus in a tomb. For me, the Christmas story is this. There's an empty tomb, and my Savior lives, and he is coming one day again for me, and I will go and be with him for eternity. And it's a decision each one of us has to make. And that for me is the Christmas story, the most important decision you'll ever make. And I just want to ask you this morning, have you opened the greatest gift that was ever given? Or are you leaving it under the tree and walking away from it again and saying, I'll do that later? You can take care of that today. Whether you're in this room, whether you've been in church for years, or you came today just for a visit, or whether you're online and you're watching by streaming, there is no greater gift than the gift of life that comes from the all-powerful God who knows you and wants relationship with you and provided a means and a method for it to happen. All I have to do is accept it. We're going to close in prayer. And then we'll have some people in the back that would love to pray with you. And if you're online and you make a decision for Christ, we would love to hear about it. We'd love to encourage you, pray with you, and uh, help you along your journey. Reach out to us through instant messaging or send us an email. But if you're in the room and you want... We'd love to pray with you in the back. And at the same time, I recognize this is Christmas. And not everybody has a family to spend Christmas with. And not everybody is joyful going into the Christmas season. And maybe you're one of those people that are struggling right now. You're going through a difficult time. And you just need somebody to encourage you, somebody to stand with you, and somebody to pray with you. We'd love to meet you in the back and pray with you about that as well. Heavenly Father, we praise your name and we worship you and honor you. We seek your face and we're so thankful this Christmas, Lord for the ultimate gift, the gift of life, with the loving God who has all power and all knowledge and chose us in eternity past to spend eternity with you. We pray, Lord, for the person here who's struggling, the person, Lord, who's uh, in a difficult season or a difficult time, and we pray, Lord, for the person who still is resisting your loving outreach in your hand. And we pray, Lord, that you just be with us as we go through this week. Help us to live our lives on purpose for your purpose in Jesus' name. Amen.